Good morning, and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Eugene Scott, national political reporter at the Washington Post. Joining me today is Representative Richie Torres in the latest installment of our Race in America series. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. So glad we could have you this morning. Uh, I, first place I'd love to start is with the pandemic, the ongoing pandemic. Uh, you represent the 15th district. That was hit especially hard with uh, among the highest rates of infection, hospitalizations, and, and even deaths in New York City when the pandemic was at its peak. What would you like to see Congress do and even this administration uh, do to ensure that the recovery is equitable? Well, as you pointed out, the South Bronx was hit the earliest and the hardest uh, by COVID-19. Uh, the South Bronx has long been ground zero for racially concentrated poverty. During the peak of the pandemic, we had the highest rate of COVID-19 morbidity and mortality. And COVID-19 you know, brought to light the deepest inequalities in our society. And one of them was the digital divide. Uh, when we were making the transition from in-person instruction to remote learning, it became painfully clear in places like the South Bronx, not everyone has access to the internet and not everyone with internet access had an electronic device at home. And so the digital divide during COVID-19 deprived largely students of color of their fundamental right to an education. And my basic concern is that the loss of learning is gonna have profound consequences that will endure long after the pandemic is gone. So one of my highest priorities is, is to close the digital divide within the infrastructure package. You know, it's often said that closing the digital divide in the 21st century is analogous to electrification in the 20th century. You just mentioned infrastructure, so I want to move there uh, for a second. Do you support the bipartisan compromise on infrastructure the president has proposed? So I, I can support a bipartisan compromise in addition to reconciliation, but I refuse to do so to the exclusion of reconciliation. You know, there's a fundamental disagreement about the meaning of infrastructure. You know, I'm a broad constructionist of infrastructure. I, I take the view that infrastructure is more than roads and bridges. It's about safe, decent, affordable housing. It's about access to the internet in an age of remote learning and telehealth. It's about the quality of the air we breathe and the food we drink. And I would want to see a reconciliation bill that embraces a more expansive view of infrastructure. And at the core of it should be affordable housing, which is my highest priority. On, on Saturday, uh, we saw Biden uh, say he will sign the bipartisan infrastructure package, even if he's unable to bring his party together for a separate bill that, you know, that includes the other Democratic spending priorities. Do you think that's the right strategy? Um, I respectfully you know, disagree. I mean, the president is certainly entitled to his view, but I suspect uh, members of the House have a different perspective. And as far as I'm concerned, we are in the midst of an FDR moment. Right? We have a historic opportunity to govern boldly in the 21st century, just like FDR did in the 20th century. And if we allow this opportunity to slip us by, um, it may never come back again. So we have to strike while the iron's hot and we have to make the boldest possible investment in the infrastructure of our country. You know, investment as a share of GDP has fallen by 40% since the 1960s. And if we as a country refuse to invest in ourselves, how can we expect to be productive at home and competitive abroad? There are countries that invest as much as 5% of their GDP in research and development. We in the United States invest less than 1%. I want to pivot a bit to voting rights. Um, you know, with the defeat of the For the People Act in the Senate, where do you think Democrats can go now on voting rights? Well, look, the greatest stumbling block on the path to progress is the filibuster. Um, so it, it's hard to answer the question without speaking about the filibuster. You know, for me, the, the structure of the Senate concentrates political power 
in a small subset of states that are much more rural, much wider, much more conservative than the rest of the America. And the filibuster carries that the systemic racism built into the structure of the Senate to, to a new extreme. You know, the notion that one senator who represents a state smaller than my congressional district could have the power to unilaterally derail the priorities of a Democratic president and a Democratic Senate and a Democratic House is profoundly undemocratic. And so I'm strongly in favor of abolishing the filibuster. And I'm strongly in favor of passing the For the People Act, which is not only about voting rights, it's about democracy reform. And then, of course, there's the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, which would restore preclearance as the national standard. One of those senators representing a, a smaller state population wise that you may be referencing is Joe Manchin of, of West Virginia. And, and you have said in the past, we are living under the tyranny of Joe Manchin. If you were to sit with him right now to talk through your concerns, what would you tell him? How would you persuade him to see things differently? Well, look, the power that he wields is seductive. So it's, it's unclear whether I could persuade him. But I would question the romanticized vision of the filibuster as the best hope of bipartisanship. The filibuster has not given us bipartisanship. It's given us nothing but gridlock. We are aiding and abetting the obstructionism of the Republican Party. You know, the Democratic Party is a party that believes in governing. And, and we are hamstrung by the filibuster. What's the point of winning the presidency and the Senate and the House if we cannot pass legislation, if we're hopelessly hamstrung by the filibuster? Something many Americans want Congress to pay more attention to is the rise in violent crime that's happening across the country, including in New York. How do you think we should deal with this issue? It is a serious issue, and but, but I, I think it's worth putting the the numbers in perspective. You know, in in 1990, in 1990, when I was only two, uh, there were 2,262 murders in New York City. Uh, in 2020, there were 468. Um, there were there had been more murders in the Bronx alone in 1990 than there were in the whole city of New York in 2020. So the murder rate remains far below the historical high in the 1990s. Having said that, we've seen the number of murders go from 289 in 2018 to 468, which is a more than 60% increase. And so that's too glaring to ignore. I have a few quick thoughts. I mean, one, we need greater investment in underserved communities of color, because wherever you have racially concentrated poverty, you will have higher rates of violence. So we have to address the root causes of crime and poverty. Two, we need greater regulation of guns. You know, the United States has more gun violence than the rest of the world because we have more guns. We have too much access to those guns and we have too little regulation of those guns. And we ought to regulate the safety of guns just like we regulate the safety of automobiles. Ever since the federal government began setting national standards of automobile safety, We've seen a dramatic plummet in the number of fatalities on the road. In a rational world, every gun would be registered and safely stored. Every gun owner would be licensed and trained, and every gun would be subject to a rational background check. But of course, we live in nothing resembling a rational world uh, because of the filibuster, because we have a dysfunctional system where one U.S. senator can filibuster gun safety for 330 million Americans, and not even the murder of elementary school children in Sandy Hook was a strong enough provocation to break the grip of the filibuster. Finally, in policing, you know, I'm in favor of reforming policing, not defunding it by 50% as the Democratic Socialist of America has proposed, not abolishing it altogether. You know, what most Americans want, what most New Yorkers want is not less policing or more policing, but better policing, right? We need transparent and accountable and constitutional policing. 
I want to stay on policing there for a second. Um, Democratic Representative Sherry Bustos from Illinois, uh, you know, who ran the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, told my colleagues this weekend that defund police is a phrase that I wish had never been uttered. Uh, we've got to do a better job of talking about what we want to do. How should we deal with the question of police funding? So look, if, if it depends on what the, I never use the phrase defund police. Um, uh, and, and I'm against plucking an arbitrary number out of thin air and then defunding police departments. That strikes me as irresponsible. Having said that, you know, there is a conversation to be had about civilianizing functions that historically have been performed by the police. We ought to explore civilianizing our response to homelessness and mental health and, and, and substance abuse. We ought to explore civilianizing traffic enforcement. Those are morally necessary conversations to be had, but that's quite different from slashing police departments by 50% or abolishing them altogether. You know, today marks uh, the anniversary of the Stonewall uprising. Can you talk a bit about where we are in terms of LGBTQ rights in this country, you know, decades later? You know, we've made progress, but we have a, a distance to travel. And I'll answer your question by way of a quick story. You know, there was an organization known as the Empire State Pride Agenda, which was the statewide lobby for the LGBTQ community in New York State. And in December of 2015, the Empire State Pride Agenda, otherwise known as ASPA, a few months following the Obergefell Ober decision, the marriage equality decision, announced that it was closing shop that it was closing its operations because it had declared its mission. And that premature declaration of mission accomplished provoked the backlash from LGBTQ communities of color. Right? The notion that marriage equality equals mission accomplished is a privileged perspective. Right? The mission is far from accomplished for LGBTQ youth who continue to be bullied by their peers at school, who continue to be evicted from their homes by their parents. The mission is far from accomplished from trans from the trans community, which is facing a historic epidemic of violence and murder. The mission is far from accomplished for LGBTQ elders who face among the highest rates of social isolation and depression and anxiety. So we have to be careful not to be complacent and not to take for granted the inevitability of progress. And we have to recognize that marriage equality is only one component of legal equality and legal equality is only one component of overall LGBTQ equality. The rights of transgender people have been, you know, headline news for a while uh, this year. And you recently introduced the first resolution to condemn state bills targeting transgender people. What do you hope this bill will do? We have to raise awareness about the dignity and humanity of the trans community, which is under siege from the Republican Party. You know, I remember vividly as a young gay man when the Republican Party under President George W. Bush in 2004 ran on a platform of opposing same sex marriage across the country, uh, won the election based on a culture war against the LGBTQ community. There's a sense in which in 2021, we are witnessing a revival of those same culture wars. The difference between then and now is that the Republican Party's culture war is specifically targeting the trans community. There is a cynical campaign of scapegoating and fear mongering against the trans community. And I find it to be outrageous. And you know, I've heard Republicans portray the Equality Act as an existential threat to womanhood and female athletics and You've had a flurry of bathroom bills across state legislatures in the United States. Uh, I find it shameful and scandalous. And instead of progressing as a society, we've seen the Republican Party double down on transphobia. Your legislation is co-signed by 30 other representatives and endorsed by 13 LGBTQ advocacy organizations. How would you persuade your colleagues who are, you know, on the fence or opposed to the bill to support it? 
Look, I have a rule. I, I, I cannot reason with people who refuse to be reasoned with. But if I were to attempt uh, to persuade people who have been engaged in, in, in transphobic politics, I, I would tell them if, if you believe in freedom uh, and respect the right of the trans community, the LGBT community, to live freely, like no one should face discrimination simply because of who we are. I would encourage them to support the Equality Act, which is based on the proposition, the American proposition, that no one should be fired or evicted or denied critical services or accommodations simply because of who you are or whom you love. We are all equal. We are all entitled to equal protection under the law, regardless of sexual orientation and gender identity. You know, this year is on track to become the worst in history for fatal anti-trans violence. What, what is fueling this violence and what else do we need to do beyond legislation to tackle this issue? Well, the coarsening of political discourse uh, is one of the causes. You know, Donald Trump's rap de demonization of the Asian community led to an outbreak of anti-Asian violence. And we are seeing the same dynamic play out with respect to the trans community. So I would urge my Republican colleagues to moderate their rhetoric because it is deeply irresponsible and it is poisonous and provocative to the point of inciting violence against the trans community. When you dehumanize a community, as the Republicans have done to the trans community, you are leaving them wide open to violence. Words have consequences. You are one of the first two gay black members of Congress. Uh, you've said every time I set foot on the House floor, I cannot help but feel the weight of history on my shoulders. What is the power of being one of the first and, and the responsibility that comes with that? Well, in the history of the United States Congress, there have only been about 130 Latino members and about 160 black members, and none of them were Afro Latino until I was sworn in on January 3rd. So as I've said repeatedly, I cannot help but feel an overwhelming sense of gratitude, the weight of history of my shoulders. You know, you know, representation matters because it means a diversity of lived experience. Um, you know, I know what it's like to face food insecurity and housing insecurity. I know what it's like to face homophobia and colorism and racism. I know what it's like to have family entangled with the criminal justice system. These are not abstractions to me. These are struggles that I've lived in my own life. And those lived experiences deeply inform how I approach public policy. You know, personnel is policy. Um, and it's important because representation inspires people to see themselves in government. Right? Communities that fail to see themselves reflected in government can easily become alienated from the political process. You know, a wise person once said, if you don't have a seat at the table, then you're probably on the menu. You know, the election of Mondaire Jones and myself means that LGBTQ communities of color have a seat at one of the most powerful tables, the United States Congress. You, you are the son of a black mother and a Puerto Rican father. You have long emphasized the intersectionality of your identity as an Afro-Latino man. What do you want to make sure people get right about understanding that intersectionality? I want to just make one correction because Wikipedia has misinformation about my. So my mother is Puerto Rican. My father is black and Puerto Rican. Okay. And what I want, I want people to understand that identity is not binary, it's intersectional. And I've had several people tell me, you, you do not look Latino. To which I reply, what does it mean to look Latino? Latino has no single look. It has no single complexion. Uh, the Latino community is not a monolith. It is a multiracial community. And you know, I resent the fact that the representation of the Latino community, both in politics and in media, have historically have been whitewashed. Uh, and thankfully, we're living in a moment of racial enlightenment, heightened racial consciousness, 
And out of that moment has come greater visibility for Afro-Latino identity. Staying on, on that topic, you know, the movie In the Heights has revived the conversation about Afro-Latino representation and colorism. What do you think we should take away from this larger conversation? We should leave the conversation. For what it's worth, I have not seen the movie, so I'm, you know, I'm in no position to, to judge the film. But hopefully the conversation will leave us with a greater appreciation for the racial diversity and intersectionality, not only of the Latino community, but the United States writ large. We are a multiracial, multi-ethnic, LGBTQ inclusive democracy, or we should strive to be one. You've, you've struggled with depression and previously shared there were moments you thought of taking your own life. As we emerge out of this pandemic, how can Congress do a better job of prioritizing mental health? Well, we have to ensure that everyone has access to mental health, which is an essential part of overall health. Um, you know, one thing I care passionately about is the need for social workers and psychology, psychologists and mental health professionals in our schools. When I was in high school struggling with depression, you know, I had no vocabulary for what I was experiencing. And there were no social workers, no mental health professionals to, to guide me through the process of figuring out what was wrong. I simply thought that I was experiencing a failure of willpower and character. And I, I you know, got caught in a spiral of self-blame. Uh, so, so I've seen firsthand how destructive it can be when there's no access to mental health services. Um, you know, 15 years ago, uh, I was at the lowest point in my life. I had dropped out of college because I found myself struggling with depression. I was abusing substances. I lost my best friend to a fatal opioid overdose. Uh, there were moments when I thought of taking my own life because I felt as if the world around me had collapsed. And then seven years later, I became the youngest elected official in the largest city in America. And today I'm a United States Congressman for the only home I've ever known, the Bronx. And I would not be alive today, let alone a member of the United States Congress, or an not for mental health, which saved my life. And, and every American should have access to the same kind of mental health treatment, the same kind of psychotherapy uh, that was instrumental in saving my life. Well, Congressman, we're glad you're doing a lot better. And we thank you for sharing that story. Uh, but unfortunately, that's all the time we have today uh, for this conversation. And I really just want to thank you for taking time out of your day to speak with me. It was an honor. Awesome. And thank you for joining us. Join my colleague Robin Gavon this Thursday at 11 a.m. for the next installment in our Race in America series. She'll speak with actor, rapper, and producer David Diggs. I'm Eugene Scott, and thank you for watching Washington Post Live.